What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town University. You are here with your beautiful hosts once again, Zach and Matt. Derek is dead, based on Matt's name right there. Yes, Derek is out of commission today. Unfortunately, uh, he's got a couple uh, things that he's got to take care of. So hopefully he feels better. But Matt, what's going on, buddy? How's your weekend so far? Uh, well, my weekend is going a lot better than Derek's, that's for sure. Um, I guess he's just on his last legs on his deathbed right now. So um, instead of us going to Traverse City in a couple weeks, we might be going to a funeral for him. So um, I hope that's not true. I hope you pull through, buddy. But um, I've had a pretty good weekend. Uh, I went to a, a wedding on Friday for one of my uh, girlfriend's, like, good friends and former co-workers. And it was a Polish wedding, so, you know, the Polish vodka was flowing by by the gallon. So it was pretty fun. Um, it was at, like, this historic plant in, um, in downtown Detroit. They had, like, all of the old, like, Ford model cars. It was pretty cool. It, it was definitely a nice venue. Um, and congratulations to John and Catherine. Uh, they are now newlyweds and, um, yeah, have fun with that. Don't go to bed angry. Uh, that's my advice to you, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing good, buddy. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Best of luck to them on their marriage. And, uh, did you go to bed and leave the, the wedding by 9 PM again? Like you did last weekend or no? Oh, I don't even know. I think, no, we left pretty late. It was like 10 30. So we did pretty good. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah we did a lot better know. this time. Even though yeah. I was telling my girlfriend we got to go, she's like, one more dance, one more song. I'm like, Ten times okay, over. whatever. <laughs> I got the keys, so I can I can leave whenever I want, but you got to come with me. Yeah. Uber home. No, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll pay for it. Yeah, my weekend's pretty good. Honestly, I've done really nothing except household duties, just as normal. So uh, just kicking back, relax, and uh, enjoying the show, right? But uh, yeah, once again, welcome back, everyone. If you guys are returning, thanks for coming back. If you guys are new, make sure that you are hitting that subscribe button. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. And make sure you're smashing that thumbs up button. It turns the frown upside down, right, Matt? No octopus today, so we'll do it ourselves. Yes, there I'll we go. All right, cool. So what do we got today? Obviously, based on the title, we will go more in depth about Jeff Petrie and kind of talking about how outside Red Wings fans and even Red Wings fans are kind of reacting to the situation, especially on social media. It's uh been an interesting week since the news broke i think it was on monday like a midday monday or something like that so just a yeah. weird trade in general but we'll go in depth at that but other than that we got around the league news some red wings news and then yeah we'll just dive deep into the red wings and jeff petrie and what it means moving forward so let's go ahead and kick it off so around the league news matt's pretty interested in this one so we'll kick this one off the qmjhl has banned fighting for ever it seems like some people like to call it a ban. Some people like to call it a uh, reprima reprimand, reformation, whatever you want. Sure, whatever. why not? Yeah, I'll, so, I'll take the word for it. so basically, if you fight, you're an instigator or whatever, then you basically get possibly a game suspension, possibly a fine. Who really knows? But uh, Matt, what does this mean for the QMJHL, the players, and uh, moving <laughs> forward, going into hockey, and what kind of situation this can bring on to the NHL? Well, this whole quote unquote ban has kind of been brewing for a while. Um I, I don't actually remember when this news broke because it was actually a, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um yeah. but they call it a ban. It's not really necessarily a ban. It's pretty much just like kind of the same similar vein as like the NCAA in hockey where you can't fight at all. Um I think it's gonna be like a game misconduct and I think maybe if you're a repeat offender you're gonna get suspended. Um, I, I don't remember the whole rules. I had them written down in front of me and now I can't find them. But I think as far as just like the QMJHL is concerned, just like that whole circle of the hockey universe, um, you know, these kids playing in the QMJHL, they're what, like 16 to 21 years old. And I, it's really probably very uncommon that a player is going to get drafted out of there. Like it's maybe like a one or 2% chance. Like maybe there's one on every team that's getting drafted out of there. So at the most part, you, you can't really look at this and say like, Oh, well these kids are going to be screwed if they go up above into like the AHL, the coast league, the NHL, they're going to need to know how to fight. They're probably not going to need to know that because they're going to play in the queue. And when they age out, they'll just do something else. So I think it's a good thing. If you are, a parent of a player in this league 
that your kid is not just going to get run over and then punch in the head. I, I think they would definitely appreciate that. Um, I I do think that this might be a little bit of a slippery slope that we're getting onto because at the Q level, I think it's fine, all things considered, with this ban or just like harsher enforcement. But I don't really want to see this go up into the AHL and the ECHL. I mean, we went to a Toledo Walleye game. You remember how many fights were breaking out there? It was, they were fighting more than they were playing hockey. It was like the movie Slapshot. So it was great. Once, yeah, it, it was great. I loved every second of it. Um, and I don't really want to see that ban trickle its way into the ECHL. I want to say it's never going to happen, but I'm really not that naive. It, it really might happen, but I I think at this level, when you're talking about kids playing hockey, it's probably probably a really good move to just make sure everyone is safe while they're playing the game they love. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you want to look at it this way. You know, it's just exactly like you said. These are just kids, first and foremost, right? And yeah, when you're in school, fighting's not allowed. Uh, we're now in an era where hockey is more skill based. It brings more excitement to the game, and <sighs> fighting is just something that, yes, we love it. We love that it's part of the sport, right? But there's also hitting. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on in the hockey, right? So. If you can at least take away the fighting, then that's only good for the players, right? Because we've heard some pretty devastating stories where players get in fights, they get out. I mean, look at Tyler Bertuzzi. If he gets in a fight, breaks a hand, then he's out for a whole entire month, right? Yeah. That's a different circumstance. But still, like these are kids that are still developing. They're growing. And one thing that you don't need is someone to get so severely hurt that it could possibly end their whole entire career. But this is a question that I was going to ask for Derek was since he's the one who played a lot more hockey than we did. But, you know, you got to think, where do majority of the injuries like the head injuries, body injuries, where did those come from? More from fighting or more from just the train wrecking hits that you take out in the open ice, you know? And so a lot of people can make the argument saying that if you're going to ban fighting, you might as well should just ban hitting, right? Because that's where majority of your injuries come from especially concussion wise. I mean, look at the NFL, for example, the CTE uh, influence on that, you know, all these fast hitting uh, players going and hitting other players, you know, just the speed that comes with it. And then the damage that it does to your body, the concussions, you know, breaking a rib, whatever it is, you know, so is this kind of a backwards movement to remove fighting? And should they just at this point, just say no hitting in general? Well, I I also think that's a slippery slope. Um, I I do know from, like, watching, like, highlights of the queue, just with, like, certain prospects that we've drafted and have been in the draft, it does not seem like it's a very physical league. Like, it's even less physical than the NCAA Hockey League, where you can't fight, but the, the hits definitely happen. I mean... You and I went to a number of Western Michigan games. I remember how rowdy that place got. Hits were thrown around left and right. But the thing about that league is the kids are wearing, you know, face cages and they're absolutely not allowed to fight. So there's not really, I, w I don't want to say there's like no risk, no safety risk. Like th there's always safety risk in the game of hockey when you're throwing hits, but it definitely seemed like the risk was more mitigated. Um, I, I really don't want to see hitting taken away. I think maybe if you're a player in the queue and you're not fighting, you could probably get by in the NHL or just any other level, just based on skill alone. But at any other level, they're going to be hitting. That's just going to happen in any level. So if yeah. you're playing in a league that doesn't hit, that's not really going to set you up for, for future success in whatever else you do in your hockey career. Yeah, I wouldn't be getting rid of hitting either. I guess the one thing that I would try to take away or not even take away, I guess one thing that should be more penalized is not even just open ice hits, but players that get hit in the head when they're open ice or players that, you know, just absolutely destroy someone and you see them obviously charging. I think that that rule is a little, it's, it's a bit of a gray area, right? Where, you don't necessarily get called for charging a lot, but you definitely see a lot of open ice hits and that can damage you. 
right? Your head hits the ice, oh, you yeah. get a concussion, and you're done. You know, whiplash. It's the same thing as a car crash, right? So you got to think about it that way. So if there's some way that you can penalize that a little bit more with the open ice hits, and then just the way that these players are falling and hurting themselves, like I said, these are kids first and foremost, and we want to see them develop and have good careers uh, moving forward. So one one damaging hit can definitely ruin that for someone. So it's a shame for sure. So I think we can move on to the next topic. So let's go ahead and talk about David Krejci and how he has retired from the Boston Bruins. And Matt put here that the Bruins are a property franchise once again. What do we think about this, Matt? After saying that, I know that you have some uh, hot takes on the Boston Bruins, but I guess for me with David Krejci, you know, fantastic career. Um, yeah, another original six team player. Uh, you love to hate him because he wasn't on our team, but overall was a pretty good center for his whole entire career. Went on a brief hiatus out of the NHL for a little bit, was convinced to come back for one final run. And now he's calling in a career with his buddy, Dave, or, uh, Patrice Bergeron. So what are, what's your thoughts on this, Matt? I mean, pretty much everyone who listens to this podcast regularly knows that I absolutely despise the Boston Bruins, and I can't really ever get that hatred out of the way. But, I mean, I, I do want to say he, he was a really good player for the Bruins, definitely a big part of their franchise. And he played, oh, let's see. I don't want to do math here. He played something. He played over 10 seasons. I thought they would listen yeah. for me on NHL.com, but they didn't. So, you know, over 1,000 games, he, he played. he played pretty much his whole career. No, he did play his whole career on the Bruins, so definitely a big part of that franchise. He was a big part of that cup run back in, is that 2010 or 20? I think it was 2011, right? 2010 was the Blackhawks? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, yeah, um, between Krejci retiring and Bergeron retiring, <laughs> what are the Bruins going to do for centers, man? Like, what, what's going to happen here? Pavel Zaka, the number one yeah. seed. He's the one C. Maybe we could uh, give you a gently used Joe Valeno, too, since we apparently are not going to sign him. Still um, not signed. Yeah, that's blow. Yeah. That's blowing my mind. Yeah, but um, I don't know. Good, great career, I guess. Um, you know, David Posternock, after signing that big extension, he's basically like, I'm going to do a verbal meme here. He's like the Bugatti in the trailer park. Just on that team now. <laughs> That's honestly a really good comparison. Honestly, um, not yeah. saying that the not saying that the Boston Bruins are a uh, trailer park team, but it definitely does not. They're de he's definitely the best piece that they have outside of Marshhand, right? So, uh, yeah. what Bert uh, Pasternak, the Bugatti Marshhands, more kind of like the uh, Dodge Viper kind of guy, and then the rest are kind of more of like the uh, Corvettes and the. Uh, Grand Prix and the old cars that you really don't need out there sitting in front of your front lawn. So, yeah, it's going to be yeah. interesting to see what goes on with them. But let's go on to the next topic, Matt. Former Red Wing, Pia Suter, this is really late to say this, but signs in Vancouver for two years at 1.6 mil AAV for those two years each. Um, good for him. Honestly, Vancouver, yeah. you guys got a good one. We, I really liked him. I loved what he brought to the table. He was originally signed for us to be a 2C. That clearly didn't work out, but that was when we were deep into the rebuild, but still was a very serviceable player. Played really good on the PK. Uh, plenty of times we saw ourselves watching him score on the penalty kill with breakaways. Um, just an all-round good player, good 200-foot player. I really liked what he brought. What do you think of P.S. Suter, and what do you think about the signing? I think it's really good value for Vancouver. I mean, Pew Suter was kind of one of those guys that I was a little bit surprised didn't re-sign with us. I I initially thought maybe it was because he was asking for too much money or just more money than we were willing to pay him for. And now he signs for 1.6, which is, I think he was making 3 million with us or at least close to 3 million. So definitely took a little bit of a pay cut. I think that was just him realizing that the market for players of his caliber was not necessarily where he thought it was. But I, I think this is... A good landing spot for Pew Suter. Um, no, they'll have him for a couple of years. And I, I've definitely said before on this podcast that Pew Suter is that guy where you can watch 20 straight games and he'll be invisible. And then there'll be one game where he's the best player on the ice. It, yeah. I, I seem to remember this last season. He had like maybe like a week scoring, like scoring streak where he was just 
like the best player on the team randomly. And then like the other yeah. 70 games, he was just, you know, a, a guy on the bench. <laughs> like that was pretty much, he was just skating around out there. But I mean, that being said, I did like him. Um, real, He was a really good shutdown setter. He's like that perfect bottom six center that you need for your team. Like he's, he's a really good depth piece. And I think the Canucks will be happy that they can, add like a, a competent defensive center and just kind of shore up their depth a little bit because we definitely know they're they're a bit of a top heavy team right now so yeah i'll, I'll always root for a former wing you know we've got him on vancouver and now heronic so um maybe i'll have to be rooting for vancouver a little bit i mean their fans can tell me that that's a bad idea and how painful it is but that's okay as long as long as they're on the team i'll i'll root for you guys I won't root for them until they give us either Hughes or Pedersen, man. So <laughs> no, okay, I'll root for work players, but not for the team. They're they're just and it's funny that you said top heavy because they're also top heavy in their contracts. They just don't know how to sign players. Yeah. But this PS Tutor one definitely was a good signing, in my opinion. So and you're right, you know, I don't know if it was because we didn't want him, if he was asking for too much money, but I think this is potentially a good move for him to where, you know, once the cap keeps on going up these next two years. Hopefully that's when he can start raking it in. And he was the youngest uh, free agent center on the market this last off season. So it was pretty interesting to see that he signed this late within the game. So, but good for him for finding a spot and being able to uh, get a good solid bottom roll pairing, not even pairing, but bottom six roll for a team that could potentially make the playoffs this off se- or this season if they uh, finally figure it out. So good looks on him. Now let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Kale McCarr makes the cover photo for NHL 24. And for those of you that are big Chelly players like me, we definitely like to call it Chell. But um, I don't know what's up with EA. They kind of have it a little backwards. I would have thought they would have put in someone from the Stanley Cup championship team, Vegas Golden Knights, someone like Jack Eichel on there. Um, I understand why you would select Kale McCarr. Very good player in the league. Definitely a top five defenseman in the league easy hands down you can even argue that he's top three you really could top 10 player top 15 player whatever but yeah i i think it's great but i definitely thought that it was going to be someone like jack eichel personally uh what do you think about the cover matt i hear you're coming from um i don't think it's that crazy of a choice though um i i did hear some rumors before it was selected that was like between him. I think Jack Hughes was, a, was one of them. And I can't remember who else. I think it was, I, I don't even really remember, but it's Kale McCarr. Um, yeah. I mean, I I'd say he's the best defenseman in the league right now. I'd say he's even the top five player in the league. I mean, obviously he missed some time last year with an injury, but he was still, I believe over a point per game as a defenseman. So that's insane. He's a year removed from winning the Norris. Um, and he was a champion last year. So, I mean, they, they didn't go with like a, like this year's champ, but they did go for Stanley cup champion. I mostly just like that. They went back to doing an action shot, like during a game that was really yeah. refreshing because this last year's version, I don't even know what the hell this cover is. Like, Oh, cool. Zegers pulled off a of Michigan once. I guess you get to be on the cover. Like <laughs> his team is, his team was the worst in the league. He didn't get anywhere near the playoffs. Low-key, that one really did make me upset. No offense to, uh, I think it's Sarah Nurse, who's also on the cover. I believe that's her name, Darnell Nurse's sister. Um, But yeah, it was very confusing to me that they selected Trevor Zegers. I understand the appeal of it, but to me, it really just didn't make any sense. So I guess that's why I kind of said, like, the whole Kale McCarr making the cover. I get it, but in the same token, I don't get it. But I, I think it's a great one. I'm still going to get the game no matter what. I did see the trailer for the game. It looks like they added a bunch of really great stuff. So I'm really excited to get my hands on the game. I'm not sure if I'm going to pre-order it yet because I really only use it to play three-on-three online uh, with my buddy Jeff. So we'll just have to wait and see. Who knows? Uh, I just, so let's go ahead I and- just hope that they're actually going to change something and not just make it the exact same game with a new coat of paint like they do with Madden every year. I mean, I barely even played last year's. And last year's, I mean, from what I've played, it, it it's dog doo-doo like it's not very good at all i still have yeah. um nhl i think it was nhl 19 i don't it was the one with Connor mcdavid on the cover i still play that one it's fun that was like yeah, the last one i played religiously yeah there's definitely a lot of past ones that are just really great right like mm-hmm. they just stick with you forever um there were plenty of college that i remember playing i think one might have been like 
2014 or 15. I think there was one with Ovi on it that I really liked, but no, they, they definitely made a lot of changes. I would definitely recommend going and watch the trailer for it. Uh, they yeah. definitely implemented a lot of new things, but the one thing that I really don't like about it is the fact that now you can do all the like spinning moves and like the Zoro or whatever the hell you want to call it. Like you could do all those fancy moves in the game. Now I kid you not. If someone scores a goal on me like that, and it's like an OT, whatever I'm slamming my controller on the floor because I will just break my game at that point. Cause like, if I, if I get scored on like that, I just have to call it quit. Like after this game, no, thank you. But uh, let's go ahead and continue with the last one. This is a pretty sad one. Maple Leafs 2025th, 15th overall pick. Rodion Amirov passes away at age 21 due to a brain tumor. This, I, I don't like the Toronto Maple Leafs as much as the next person, but being a human being, this is really sad. This was, this is something like, this is the worst nightmare for anyone, right? Like, and supposedly, like, there were great signs moving forward, supposedly, that there was a good opportunity for him to get better and be able to come back. Um, but unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, but this is definitely one of the last things that you want to hear is that a young, highly touted prospect was not being able to continue out living his dreams and unfortunately passed away. So rest in peace to... Rodion Amirov and thoughts and prayers out to his family. And, you know, this really does suck for the Maple Leafs organization as a whole. You got a, you got a little piece on that there, buddy. That's yeah, sad, man. He was so young and um, I, I don't really have anything else, anything else to say other than fuck cancer and RIP Rodion, you know, it's, it's real sad. Yeah. Fuck cancer, honestly. All right. Let's go ahead and dig into the Red Wings news, shall we? Some fun stuff here. So, like Matt mentioned at the start of the episode, we will be going to the Red Wings Prospect Tournament, and we did get it correct. It would be starting on September 14th, and that goes on to the 17th, so a Thursday to that Sunday. We going! We going. Uh, I yes, believe sir. My dad and I are going up there Thursday. Hopefully we can catch the first Red Wings game. Uh, we will be staying in... Uh, area close to Traverse City, so it won't be too far of a drive for us to get to the arena. Uh, I believe you and Derek are coming that Saturday, correct? Yeah, I'm planning on doing that Saturday, and since I'm starting a new job, I don't get the time off, which, you know, that's whatever. But, uh, yeah, I'll be there Saturday, and I believe that's when... I think the Red Wings are playing Columbus, I want to say, or maybe Dallas. I don't really remember who who they're playing, but I will at least get to see one game. I'll get to see Marco Casper mm-hmm. and Nate Danielson just fucking zip around the ice and just, you know, basically look like Connor McDavid and Wayne Gretzky had a baby out there. Um, that's definitely what's going to happen. Uh, I'm definitely uh, a little disappointed that there's going to be no ISP, but I, I think he'll actually be playing in the SHL at that point. So, you know, what can you do? Yeah. We've, we've seen plenty of him this summer, yeah. and we, we like what we see. So, yeah, we're totally fine with that. Yeah. Yeah, he's already putting work in over in uh, Sweden, so good on ASP. He looks pretty good so far. So, yeah, that season will be starting as soon as our uh, prospect tournament will be kicking off. But, yeah, the Red Wings play on Thursday. They play Saturday, and then they play Sunday. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it to the Sunday game because uh, I'm taking my dogs up to Traverse City as well, and our Airbnb kicks us out at around 10 a.m. in the morning. So that's great. And the game, I think, is at, like, 1130 in the morning or some something like that. So we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe I can work it around my schedule, but yeah. So if you guys are going, make sure to look out for us. We'd love to hang out with you guys, kind of chat with you guys about the Red Wings in general, the prospects, and uh, we'd love to meet some of y'all. Other than that, this is a fun little one that we're kind of late on this one as well. The Red Wings did a poll, a voters poll for us, the fans to vote on. And one of the things that they talked about was Red Wings getting a mascot and potential third jersey option. So let's talk about the mascot. It's got to be an octopus, right? It can't 100%. be anything else. Like 100%. that is. Have you ever seen the photo of the old Red Wings mascot and it's like a bird and <laughs> it just looks like it's like something that should have been McDonald's related? Have you ever seen that? I'll I'll take your word for it. I've never seen that. It, it sounds like it's something I don't want to see, but uh, I didn't even know that happened. Yeah, it was back in the day. I think it was before I can't 
No, I don't think Must it was like like before they 70s? were the rivals. Yeah, it was a lo- it was a while ago. Yeah, and it yeah. just obviously never stuck around. But yeah, yeah. it's got to be an octopus at this point, right? I mean, Al the octopus, like it's got to be something relative to that. Like, just make it have like a bunch of tentacles, and then when it walks up and down the stands, it just whacks people in the face. You know, just make it fun for everyone. <laughs> I need that. Honestly, it's got to be. I something- need that, man. And it's got to be funny. It's got to be almost kind of like gritty, right? Not fuzzy, but something that's just like out there and just like makes the whole entire crowd more amped up to be able like when it's just walking around and seeing it so that's definitely one thing that i would like for the red wings to implement i think that that would be a lot of fun especially for the kids right like you want to make it more of a family atmosphere for your kids as well all hail uh-huh. king george for an example i think i think what it needs to be is yes they can have the arms it can whack people in the face what i also need it to have is on all eight of the arms it has a cup holder for a beer and it's just passing out beer to people that's what i need <laughs> I absolutely need that. And maybe if you want it more kid friendly, you could put beers in half the arms and hot dogs in the other. So here you go, mm-hmm. Dad. You get a beer. Your son gets a hot dog. And let me whack you in the face while I go back down to the cheap seats. <laughs> That's what I need. Up a sign that says, "I'll give you free drinks and hot dogs if you let me whack you in the face." <laughs> it needs to do just the most wild shit. Just like, like imagine. Just remember what, like, Ruddy was doing when he came into the league. He was, yeah. like, just doing all this wild shit. He was, like, going viral, talking shit to celebrities on Twitter. He was, like, going down on a rope from the ceiling onto the ice. We we need the octopus to do that. We need we need this thing to be doing, like, Cirque du Soleil, like, performances and stuff at, like, intermission. We need it just, like, swinging around the ceiling. I need it to just be doing just the most wild shit possible. I need it to be up where the like the organ player is and it needs to be using all eight of its arms to play the organ and just making it sound terrible i i need that more than i need air that needs to happen oh yeah 100 percent. but we know how the red wings organization is as a whole they're kind of a little boring but i think that that would be a great implementation that they could utilize at their expense and just bring more people to the arena to have fun so let's talk about the third jersey buddy now This would just be an alternate jersey that they could wear. I'm sure that they probably wouldn't wear it for more than 20 games in the season. Probably no more than 20 as well. But you look around the league, a bunch of teams already do it. And I get it. It's not talking about changing the Red Wings logo or their current jerseys, the red and the white jerseys. But just having another option, I think, is a great way for the Red Wings organization to obviously make more money but also for us, the fans, to have just a little more options and creativity and what we can wear to the games. What are your thoughts on a third jersey? Is this something you're interested in? If so, how would you, if you had the option, how would you design it? What color would you want it to be? I, I've i been thinking about this for a little bit, and it's kind of a good problem to have that we – our, like the main jersey for the Red Wings is just it's an absolute work of art. It's one of the most iconic, iconic. logos yes. in all of sports, and the jersey itself is beautiful. I mean, there's there's a reason it's been pretty much untouched ever since they became the Red Wings, and I don't even know like the 1920s. Yeah. So it's definitely a tall test to try and reinvent that. I really feel like the like that Winter Classic jersey that they wore against the. Um, the Maple Leafs, when they played in the big house in Ann Arbor, if they mm-hmm. could do something like that as the alternate jersey, that would be perfect. I mean, there's really – it's a really tall task to redesign it, but they got pretty damn close with that. I mean, that was a really nice jersey, like a, a different spin on the on the Red Wings design, and I really liked it. It also kind of tied a little bit into, like, the Tigers, too, with, like, the, the old school style D. I, I don't really know what you call that thing, but – Look kind of like the Tigers. Old English G. Yeah, old English G. There you go. Um, something like that would be nice. Uh I know that there's like also like I don't remember when they wore this jersey. It was like kind of like the off white kind of cream color jersey that was like a little old school and the, the logo was a little smaller. Do you even know what I'm talking about? It's like off white. I think that was the other winner. Yeah, I think that was the, that was other, the other winner one. classic that they went up against yeah. uh the Pittsburgh Penguins. That would be nice too. Or was it Chicago? I do no, I can't remember who it was. Maybe. I don't remember who it was. I can't think that far back. I don't even remember what I did last weekend. Um, Yeah, but another idea is I remember like in, I think it was like the early 90s, like kind of like Lidstrom's first few years, they were wearing like kind of like the 
old school. It was almost like a barber pole striped jersey that said Detroit on it. That'd be a good one, too. That's pretty similar to, like, what their reverse retro was this year, except, you know, they're not going to put black in it for some reason. I don't know where they got that from. Um, I think that would look nice, too. Um, I I just really don't know what options they're going to have when Fanatics takes over. I don't know if they're going to do that reverse retro again because that was, you know, that was kind of an Adidas thing in collaboration with the NHL. So who even knows what they're going to be doing from here? Um, But yeah, I I really like that idea as an alternate. I I think that both those designs are really nice. They're like a classic clean look. Um, I mean, there's purists out there who say you should never change up the Red Wings jersey. I kind of tend to be one of those purists. I, I really just love the jersey, and I don't think that you need anything different because you can't fix what ain't broke. But, you know, there's teams like Seattle and Vegas who have a third jersey. They've been in the league for not even, what, like 10 years? Like Seattle's been in the league two years. They already have an alternate. So, yeah, we could definitely get with the times here. But um, I, I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel. I think there's some past designs you can do that would look pretty clean as an alternate. Yeah, I agree with you. And this isn't, yeah, it's exactly like you said, everything that you said, I agree with. Yeah, you can't, there's nothing that you can change really on the current jerseys. Just need a little pizzazz, a little more fun. Just having that third alternate, whether if that's because I have the retro reverse jersey from last year. I absolutely love it. I love that they included the black on there. I think it's great. If you can do that for a third jersey, if it was just all black with the Red Wings logo and maybe you added like a little bit of red or like a little bit of silver in there, I think That'd that be would cool be too. great. I'd you like know? that. Or, or if you do something to where like you incorporate the old English D and you include the the winged wheel on it too. you could. There's so many different options that you could utilize at your expense that it will sell. We Red Wings fans love Red Wings jerseys, right? So mm-hmm. just so many different options that you could choose from but you're right you know there's there's definitely a lot of purists out there that would say you know don't fix what isn't broken right because the red and the white jerseys are just super iconic i mean plenty of ah uh, uh famous people love the red wings logo i mean you can go back to the history of time tupac ferris bueller a bunch of people a lot of people love the red wings jersey but yeah, I think it's time that we get with the times. And from a marketing standpoint, you know, that brings the team more money. And then it brings us, the fans, joy of having this one-of-a-kind jersey that is a third option for the team. And like I said, you don't have to wear it for more than 10 games in the season. Just do it like you did for the Retro Reverse, where it was the seven to nine games that you got to wear them. Just not when you're being broadcasted on ESPN because we never win when ESPN broadcasts us because they always say our players' names wrong and they don't know anything that they're ever talking about. But I digress. Anyways, but yeah. What do you mean? Isn't uh, is it Mason Raymond playing for the Red Wings now? He came out of retirement and played oh for my, the Red Wings? Oh my God. No, stop. <laughs> stop, please. I did not like that. But um, no. No one does. Um, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of doing a third Jersey option. Um, you literally could just give me anything. It could just be the off white, the cream color, kind of like Matt said, where it was utilized in the winter classic from a, what, 10 plus years back now, it seems like. So there's definitely a lot of different options. Even if you did like a skyline of the Detroit, uh, that'd be cool. Yeah, nice. and, and then added the old English D or just the winged wheel on there. There's so many different options that they can utilize. You just got to have the right people that are designing it for you, and it will definitely sell. But I don't think that even if they just made it atrocious, people are still going to buy it, right? Because there's definitely a lot of people out there that like to collect jerseys in general. And, you know, I think that this is a great fun way for the organization to get more fans involved and brings them more money into their pockets because we know little Caesars loves money. They do. Yeah. They'll just How about, how about this? Maybe you could just do like an octopus Jersey and you could just have eight armholes. Purple, That'd be perfect. A purple Jersey with Al, the octopus yeah. holding the winged wheel. Oh my God. I think you are. That'd be amazing. Something. All right. Yeah. Well, if they take your idea, we know that it came from us. Well, how about, how about they just do like one gigantic Jersey? Like it could just be a tarp. And it has like eight armholes and you fit four players in it. You could put like a forward line in it and maybe like one defenseman in it. That'd be perfect. And it's just like, it's basically like the flying V 
from Mighty Ducks, but it's the Flying Octopus. The Flying Octopus. I like it. All right, we're going to trademark this before the Red Wings steal our ideas, right, yeah, buddy? we're sitting on the gold mine here. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next topic. So this one's a little bit of a fun one. The NHL Network on Twitter put out a list of the top 50 prospects. Uh, only two Red Wings prospects made that list. I don't know what the criteria was. I'm assuming you had to meet a certain game minimum because if you play more than 20 games, then you're considered not a prospect anymore unless your name is Michael Bunting playing in three separate NHL seasons. Yeah. And then once you're could... 27 years old, yeah, more like 50. Oh my God. What an yeah, old man. Right. So the two players that they had on there were Edmondson at number 11 and then Marco Casper at number 25. Thoughts on this, Matt initial reaction. Well, uh, yeah, I read this list a while ago. I don't remember exactly who was on it, but um, I guess it's fine, to be honest with you. Like, Edmondson has gotten some games, so you have some tape on him. You you kind of know who he is. I mean, nine games is not enough to really know who a player is, but you've seen that, like, he's a big defenseman who uses his body and his long reach very well. He got a couple, like, lucky bounce goals, but I think all in all, he, he's going to be competent in the offensive zone. Um. I, I just think that there's so many good def, like defensive prospects in the league, and to have Edvinson 11, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little surprised he's that high, just not necessarily because I don't think he should be. I, I just know with these type of lists, with the NHL in general, they don't really give the Red Wings much shine. So I'm really happy to see Edvinson at 11. And Casper at 25, I, I don't know. I mean, he played in the SHL. It's a more defensive league, so... Like, people will look at his numbers. I don't have them in front of me, but I think he only put up, like, 20-something points. And people will look at those numbers, and they'll be like, oh, well, that's really not that much, is it? And we Red we Red oh, Wings fans <laughs> know that we've gotten so many guys from the SHL, we know that that's, like, lighting the league on fire, you know? So I, I think it's fine he's a 25. He's really only played one game and didn't really do anything in that game. Uh, I mean, he was injured, granted, but... Yeah, I, that's fine that we have two on here. Um, they're, they're definitely our two best prospects, so I'm happy to see them on there. Um, I I would say maybe like the one other guy who got left off was Carter Mazur. I mean, he lit up the NCAA when he was with Denver and won a national title a couple years ago. Um, that that's like the only snub for this list, but you know, overall, it's it's fine. It's not really anything less than I expected, to be honest. Yeah, it's pretty tough to say that it's it's unfair for Evanson to be at number 11. I mean, you have – there's a lot of good prospects with other teams, right? you got to think about it. There's 32 teams in the league, so it's going to be tough to compete with all those other players that have been drafted with these other teams, right? So even for Marco Casper, yeah, I think the lack of NHL exposure probably put him at 25, but I do – want to give props to NHL Network for at least putting them in the middle of the rankings, uh, hopefully with the understanding that, kind of like you said, the SHL is definitely more of a defensive tight league. And the fact that he put up 20-something points when a 17-year-old kid in a men's league, that's a, that shows that you're a gamer for sure and that you're a pretty good soon-to-be NHL player, right? And he's a good prospect for the Detroit Red Wings, so... Yeah, uh, in terms of snubbed, I guess I would have to agree with you that Carter Mazur was probably snubbed because, like you said, he won a championship two years ago, uh, played really well for the University of Denver these last two seasons, now making the jump into Grand Rapids, and he got to play a couple games, and he looked pretty good for those couple games, too, towards the end of the season. So I do think that you probably could have put him at number 50, but... Like I said, there's 32 teams. Even if you took one player from each 32 teams, you only got 18 spots left. So, and we know that there are certain organizations that have some premier top talent for sure. And this isn't a knock on Carter Mazur, but now this is Carter Mazur's way of just kind of going out there and showing them that they fucked up on this list and saying, yeah, you guys should have put me in the top 50 for sure. But I think another prospect or at least a couple prospects that you can make the argument for would be Wallander, Johansson, maybe even Kosa, but I could make the argument for Kosa just because he only played in the ECHL last year that he couldn't potentially make the list. But like I said, I can't say this enough. There's 32 other organizations within the league that have really good damn prospects in there. 
that can make that push into the top 50. So there's always going to be someone left unhappy with that list, right? And there's only so much that you can do. It just comes down to these prospects to kind of show them that like, hey, you guys have to, you guys should have put me on this list. And hopefully some of these prospects that we have can utilize that energy and put it towards something good and kind of show them, like I said, that, yeah, you guys effed up. So, all right, Matt, I think we can move on to our main topic here, which is not other than based on the title, Jeff Petrie is now a Detroit Red Wing who was traded to the Montreal Canadiens for a 2025 fourth round pick, which is conditional. It will be either Boston's or our fourth round pick, whichever one is the later pick in exchange for Gustav Lindstrom as well with that fourth round pick and Montreal retains 50% of that salary. I believe the Red Wings only have to pay 38% based on him already beginning retain some of that. So his contract comes in at, if I scroll down here, it's like 2.8 something million dollars. I have to backtrack here. Uh, 2.34375 million dollars. So for the Red Wings, getting a right-handed defenseman, who is now 35 years old, will be 36 in December. He's right shooting defenseman, six foot three, 209 pounds. I th- personally, I thought this was a great trade. You upgraded from Gustav Lindstrom. A lot of people outside of Red Wings fandom seem to disagree on that, but you look at Jeff Petrie while granted, yes, he is not a Montreal Canadian where he was consistently putting up 40 plus points, but just a year removed for the Pittsburgh Penguins in 61 games, he put up five goals, 26 assists, and 31 points. That's more than what Gustav Lindstrom ever did for us in this four-year stint that he got to play on and off with us. And he was a healthy scratch for more than ha- half of the season last year. So to me personally, I think this is a great upgrade. Uh, the trade really did catch me off guard. I got the notification but didn't pay attention to it, and I got a text from a buddy, Carlo. Shout out to you, buddy. Um and just said, Iserman's a wizard. I was like, what the hell did I just miss? So I thought, once again, I thought that this was a great trade to make. And this was a great acquisition for the team. It just gives us more depth. Uh, Matt, give me your thoughts on this trade. What you think about Jeff Petrie, possibly where he fits in the lineup. And uh, what does this mean for the team moving forward? Especially that we have a bunch of prospects, like we just mentioned right before this, that are hoping to gain spots within the next year or two because we have them for the next two years on the right side. So what does this mean all in all? Well, I, I think this trade um, really more so was just the Canadians trying to do right by Jeff Petrie. We know that he's from the area and it was, it really felt like it was only a matter of time before he became a Red Wing. You know, his, his dad played for the Tigers and I think he actually still is like broadcaster or something with the team i I know he works with the team in some capacity i don't remember exactly what he does but yeah it's cool to have him come home um at the age he is now he's 35 so i i imagine this is probably going to be his last stop in his career unless someone wants to overpay for an aging defenseman by all means go right ahead but yeah i i think um this is pretty much just looking at it and saying like okay we gave up what a fourth round pick we're at the stage in the rebuild where that doesn't really mean much to us anymore. And yeah. Gustav Lindstrom, who was barely in, even an NHL to begin with. And Jeff Petrie at age 35 was already better than Gustav Lindstrom at whatever he is, 23 or 24. So yeah, I, I think overall it, it was a trade that makes sense. Um, as far as where he slots into the lineup, I could really see him playing anywhere to be completely honest with you. Um, yeah. but, you know, our, our top two is locked up and Wallman insider. I really kind of feel like this bottom four, you just jumble them around and see what works, see what doesn't that, that really feels like the best move. Um, but you know, but there's still going to be an odd man out every night. Now that we have seven capable NHL D men on in our defensive core. Um, so I, I don't even really know who the odd man out could be. I guess it's just whoever throws a pizza up the ice and blows an assignment to, kill the other player <clears throat> um but uh yeah it's it's definitely um a good problem to have that you need to scratch one of these guys on any given night um i think as far as our prospects go listen i mean in, in next year we'll have shrot for two more years hall for two more years petrie will probably still be here for another year if you're one of the guys I mean, like Wallander, Johansson, 
and you can't beat out Justin Hall or 36-year-old Jeff Petrie for a spot, that's on you, man. Yeah. That is all on you. If you are not progressed enough in your in your hockey career and your game is not progressed enough to be NHL ready, uh, we got more problems here than just, you know, aging defensemen on the roster. We Our, our guys aren't ready yet, and that's not a good thing. Um, I, I've definitely seen people be very vocal on Twitter saying, yeah. why would we sign another defenseman? Edvinson played games last year. They're blocking him from our lineup. Hey, dummy. He had shoulder surgery, dummy. What What are you even talking about? He's not even going to be ready. What do you want him to do? You want him to swing out there with one shoulder and just clap bombs and fucking break his shoulder permanently? What What do you What do you want him to do? Like, he had surgery. Of course we had to go get another person. Oh, and guess what else? Uh, if someone gets knocked out of this lineup with an injury, which it will happen, we don't play in the NHL of injuries off. This is not NHL 23. We've got depth. I mean, that guy who's scratching the penalty box, who you say, oh, that's bullshit. He should be playing tonight. Well, if someone takes a puck to the knee and they break their kneecap, God forbid, that person will be in. And then you still have six capable NHL defensemen. So it's not going to be like in years past where, oh, we had an injury. Let's go get Madison frickin' Bowie from the Washington Capitals. Let's go get Alex Biega, who was bad on a terrible Vancouver Canucks team. We're not doing that anymore. We're also not thrusting guys who are not ready yet into the lineup because we have no one else. That's another thing we're not doing. We're making sure that they're ready. So I don't really understand where these people are coming from. You got Gossespierre on a one-year deal, so he's going to be gone. That leaves a spot for someone else. Um, I really feel like with another year's experience with Johansson, Wallander, wh- whoever else playing in the, a- a- in the AHL and whoever else they're playing, they should be much better with another year's worth of experience. And if they're not, then we're really in trouble here. We got to rethink something. Yeah, there's definitely multiple ways that you can look at this, right? But one thing that I wanted to go into, you brought up basically the 2019 lineup that Eiserman came into with the Red Wings that Ken Holland left us with. So let's go ahead and talk about that depth back in 2019. So your top pairing was Heronic, Philip Heronic, and Trevor Daly, Madison Bowie, Dennis Chalowski on the second pair, Patrick Nemeth and Danny DeKaiser as your third pairing, and Alex Biega as your extra. Now, we did do a poll on our YouTube community tab that was basically asking, with Steve Eisenman been, been getting plenty of scrutiny for the way he's managed his team since becoming the general manager in 2019, in your opinion, is the decor better or worse since he took over? And looking at the lineups now, you got Cider Wallman, this says Hall and Ghost Ghost Bear, Mata and Sherrod, and then let's just say Petrie is the seventh defenseman. Out of the twenty-eight votes, eighty-nine percent said that it was better. And I'm assuming the eleven percent are trolls or just people who really don't understand what depth truly means, saying that it got worse. So in my opinion, I'm going with the eighty-nine percent and following suit that this is definitely better. And then you go on Twitter that we also did a poll that got 49 votes. Thank you for those of you that voted. If you guys aren't following us on Twitter who do watch us or listen to us, go ahead and do that. We do a lot of uh, we do have a lot of feedback on there as well. Uh, with the acquisition of Jeff Petrie, where will he fall in the lineup for the Detroit Red Wings? 59% of those 49 votes said that he would fall in the third pair. If I'm looking at it, he used to play with Ben Sherratt in Montreal. That could be your third pair right there. And they did a really good job, especially during that Stanley Cup run where they went all the way to the finals. So if you get Jeff Peachy to be the guy who can actually be the point getter and then Ben Sherratt just go ahead and hopefully not blow miss assignments. But I do think that Ben Sherratt, his main issue was is that he was playing on the top line, something that he probably isn't accustomed to. So we relied too much on him and that's what kind of brought Cider down a little bit. So by putting him on the third pair, that's doing him a favor and that's doing the team a favor, right? He should be more than acquitted to playing on that third pair. Now, in terms of who the seventh D-man is, that's that's going to be interesting. That's going to be a tough call. A lot of people seem to think, or at least NHL Network think that's going to be Olimata, which to me, I don't see that happening. I think Olimata does a really good job at being a defensive defenseman. He looks really good for us. And granted, he did have, I think it was 
I can't remember if it was him or Huso. Uh, they had pneumonia, but someone got uh, Olimata was out for a brief period of time, right? So yeah, he had he to was react. Sick. Yeah, he yeah. had to reacclimate himself out there, and that took a bit of time, right? So, but I do think that Olimata can insert himself in the lineup. Maybe it's between Petrie and Hall, but you know, if you can rotate these players, you know, you have, and that's what a lot of people are saying, right? We have a lot of older players on our D. Okay, so we got five aging veteran defensemen, right? Okay, let's exclude Mata because he's actually technically not that old, but he brings a lot of experience to the team. You know, if you have to rotate these players, that's fine. That helps with them not being injured, right? Having them playing consistently in night in and night out, that only helps them out, lets them recuperate their bodies a little bit. I, I think that's perfectly fine. And it definitely gives you a little bit more advantage going up against the other teams who are like, okay, who are we going to play tonight? We really don't know. So, but we always know that Wallman and Sider are going to be the top pairing. And then the bottom two pairings, yeah, it's all going to come down to whatever Derek Lalone thinks, Coach Lalone thinks that is going to be the best for that night. And that's going to be interchangeable. We're probably going to see a lot of line jumpings in that regard. Um, if I had it my way, I do think that you have to include Ghost Bear up there. And then someone who's defensively reliable, someone like an Olimata. And then, yeah, I think that third pairing will be Sherratt and, and Petrie. Honestly, I think that they will have good chemistry working together. I think Derek Lalone will enjoy having them both on a pairing. And then Justin Hall's just going to have to figure out a way and how he can get himself into the lineup. But I think it will be between Hall and Petrie that are the ones that are going to be interchangeable. And I do think that Hall can be a serviceable bottom pairing defenseman as well. A lot of people people give him a lot of shit for how he played over in Toronto. And I think it was just a little unfair. It was the same thing with Ben Sherratt when he was playing in Montreal, when he got traded to Florida. They just utilized him improperly, playing them top-line pairing minutes uh, in situations that they're probably not used to or comfortable with doing and just ended up being everyone's whipping boy on those teams. So I do think that we are in a good spot here. And then in terms of... Yeah, a lot of people were questioning the signing, or not even the signing, the trade, and how you have Simon Edmondson. Now, whatever your thoughts are on Simon Edmondson, good prospect, just a prospect, whatever. This blocks him from being able to make it onto the roster. Matt, you're right. Yes, he did have surgery back in April. It was a shoulder surgery, and it's going to take him time to get back up the pace. So him playing and starting in Grand Rapids is not the worst thing for his development. We know that Albert Johansson, if he did not get injured, Eisenman came out and said, we were going to give him some opportunities with the team. So I think that the main goal here is, is to let these players get acclimated with each other down in Grand Rapids, let them get some playing time. Injuries are bound to happen. And then when those happen, they're going to get the call up. It's not that they're bad and that we're stopping them from being able to grow. They can still grow in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids hasn't been good since Tyler Bertuzzi won the Calder Cup for them. What was that? Almost 10 years ago as well. So we need them to be just as good as we want ourselves to be good, right? So if the Griffins can be good this year, that does them good. Those players, they need to learn how to play together because eventually they're all going to be with us as well within the next two to three years. So if we can get them to stay consistent and actually put up a really good season where they can make it into the playoffs, that's going to transition into the NHL just fine. And I am not nervous that Edmondson's not going to get playing time this year, but it definitely comes down to some of these players. Like maybe Wallander can push his weight into the lineup somehow. You just never know. Just because we got these players, these certain players, doesn't mean that they're Progress is being stopped and there's a gap between them making the jump. They can most certainly make the jump. It comes down to them and how they prove themselves in the prospect tournament, the training camp, whatever it is that they're doing, the, uh, the preseason games e even. So we'll just have to wait and see on that. But yeah, I think that this was a good depth signing. I think a lot of fandom outside of Red Wings in the NHL world are... They, they like to rip on Steve Eiserman and just questioning his ability to get players that make this team good. And it's like, well, where do you, you, you're not getting Steven Stamkos or Leon Dreisaitl's in free agency anymore. It just doesn't happen. 
Look at David Pasternak. He signed his deal before even going into free agency. Those types of players just don't make it anymore. We're still going to be a competitive team. Are we going to make the playoffs? I'm not going to sit here and say yes. Is that my dream? Yeah, I want us to make the playoffs. And I think Iserman really wants us to make the playoffs. But it, it ultimately comes down to the players and the fact that this team went out and got depth. We all This team has really, really good players on it. You know, if you can get more guys to be consistent players where they're not getting injured, you're getting more players that are closer to the Larkin level where you can get the 80 points. We get a couple, maybe one or two 70-point guys. Andrew Kopp, you know, after his court surgery season, can actually put up more than 10 goals this season. Players need to step up. I do think that that's possible. So I'm excited to see exactly what goes on, but I think people are being a little too hard on Steve Weisman. Do I like some of the things that he's done? I think the Ben Chirac contract was bad. Yeah, I'll admit it. I think it was bad. We've said that multiple times. The Andrew Kopp contract, a little too long for my liking, but this is what happens in free agency. You have to technically overpay. But by the time that all these young prospects come up, they won't even matter. They will not. What are your thoughts on this, on basically what I've just said so far? Are you on agreement with me, or is, do you have a different thinking process on how this is all working out? And it, should we be worried about Steve Eisenman and the Iser plan? Because that's what everyone keeps on doing, Iser plan. I don't really understand like what people think the alternative is for the Iser plan at this point. Like We don't have lottery luck, so we don't have the guys that you draft in the top end of the of the of the draft and oh the, all of a sudden they just come in and they're regular NHLers in their first or second year but we haven't had that we haven't really had that since Raymond and even Raymond took a step back which you know it's a slump it's whatever but yeah like people criticize the deals for Hall they criticize the Sherratt and the cop deals or no, no sorry the comfort and the cop deals they criticize yeah. all those deals and they say well why do we sign these guys long term what's the other option I mean, what what else are you going to do in free agency? He can't go out there and trade for Connor McDavid every year. He probably doesn't even have enough assets to even do that. Like, I I don't really know what the alternative is. Like, it's like you said, like the big name free agents, they don't get to free agency anymore because the GMs who own those guys will say, hey, let's get this done or you're going to get traded. I mean, we just put out a list of next year's free agents. You know who the big two are at the top of that list? Matthews and Stamkos. They're not going to free agency, bro. They're not going to free agency. Stamkos is going to be a bolt for life, and Austin yeah. Matthews is going to make stupid money. He's going to make sheets. Like, they're not going to get to free agency. So next year, if we're sitting here and we're saying, oh, well, why did we sign, I don't even know, this middle six center for this money, what else are we supposed to do? Like, Casper, sure, he could make the team next year. He's not going to be playing top six center role. He's just not because he's, you know, we love him. He's very talented, but he's not there yet in his development. And I would much rather him play first line center in Grand Rapids on the first power play and light it the fuck up. Excuse my language. I would rather see him light up the AHL and just run that town than play here in a bottom six role as like a bottom six center. I don't want to see that because I don't think that's going to help him. It's like, our prospects will be here at some point. Marco Casper will be playing center for this team for hopefully his whole career. Danielson will be on this team playing center. Carter Mazur will be on this team. Who knows where he'll be playing, but he will be playing. It's not going to happen next year, though. Do not expect any of these guys to kick down the door and say, fuck you, Connor Bedard, Logan Cooley. I don't give a shit who you are. I'm going to win rookie of the year. It It, it doesn't happen, dude. That does not happen. So what do we do in the meantime? We sign capable NHL players. Oh, and guess who we actually signed? The big free agent in, in this year. Uh, JT Comfort. He won a fucking cup. He won a cup with Colorado and played a big role. So he's going to come in and he's going to have that veteran wisdom and he's going to teach the team how to win because nobody knows that better than a guy who went to the cup final and won the cup. Uh, Look at the defense. Sherratt and Petrie, they went to the cup finals in Montreal. Hall was playing big minutes in the Stanley Cup contender. Granted, it was Toronto and they're snake bitten, but he was still playing big minutes. 
Olimata won two cups with Pittsburgh. What are we even talking about here? These are very valuable players, and they're solid NHL players. I, I, it blows my mind that people can even criticize this because the number one thing that we're paying for in these players is veteran leadership because that's what you need when you have young players in a rebuild. You bring your prospects up. You say, hey, Marco Casper, my name is JT Comfer. I won a cup. I played NHL center for, I don't even know, six or seven seasons. I'll teach you how to do it. I'll play on your wing. I don't even know what we're talking about here. Like, this is how you help your prospects be successful. You get those successful veteran players, and they will help your players progress. I mean, what would you rather have? Would you rather have Marco Casper come into this team and there's nothing here? There's It's just full of AHL plugs on minimum deals? You don't want that. What is he going to learn? He's better off playing in Grand Rapids. So I just, I don't really understand it. I don't really understand what else other people think we should do. Should we go out and trade for Connor Bedard right now? Should we call Chicago and say, hey, Kyle Davidson, um, I know you just got your next franchise piece, but uh, you mind if we take him? What are we supposed to do? What's the alternative? I don't understand. Um, I, I don't know. That's that's my rant. It, it just blows my mind. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know how else Eisenman was supposed to play the hand that he was dealt. He he got dealt a shitty fucking hand, not only by Ken Holland, but by Gary Bettman too, by just not really giving him any lottery luck. And I, I know Bettman doesn't control that. I'm not an idiot, but still, I'll blame Bettman because I hate his guts, but there's really been no help. He's been doing it on his own and yeah. he's, you know, he's, he's been doing a lot of these big moves on his own. He's obviously had his scouting department, helping him find talent later in the draft, which we have in Carter Mazur and Amadeus Lombardi. I, I just, I don't know. I, I like what he's building. Um, I think maybe really the only criticism you could give him is it's not as far along as we'd like it, which that's really not even his fault. I mean, he'd be the first one to admit that. That's what he said after the season. You know, when we were in that playoff hunt and we got smacked by Ottawa, uh, I hate you guys, by the way. Um, that's what he said in this press conference. He's like, I'm disappointed. I thought we'd be further along. So nobody hates losing more than him. He probably hates losing as much as he loves winning. I would definitely say that's true, but I don't know. I think that's enough for me. I, I, I like what's happening here. I think pretty much every move that he's made has improved the team. I, I, really, all I could say is the Sherratt deal was terrible, but it, it, that was the market. I don't really even care anymore. He's gone in three seasons. Um, yeah. we, we have three seasons where we're watching Hall and Sherratt. That's going to suck. But at the end of those three seasons, we're watching Wallander, ASP, Anton or Albert Johansson, excuse me, maybe on Anton Johansson too. Um, yeah, we're watching those guys, man. So for now, that's what we got to do. Yeah. And like I said before, no, I, I agree with you in everything that you said once again. I mean, it's just really silly. And I get it right that majority of these people that are saying these things are outside of Red Wings fandom. So either that's <laughs> lack of knowledge or just being a troll because that's what people love to do online, especially with hate to call out some some fan bases i'm not even going to do it but yeah there's plenty of fan bases out there that just love to hate the red wings and we live in their heads rent free a little bit here so um a lot of people just like to give us grief because we're not as far along in our rebuild or at least talent wise as some of these other teams because they were gifted top five picks we were handed one in the first four years that eiserman was running the team and you know, it, it really sucks. There's not really much that he could have done. And we were left with nothing, or he was left with nothing, Iserman, when he took over for Ken Holland. There was absolutely nothing. that You had Dylan Larkin. That was it. That was it. And mm -hmm. some could say, yeah, you he gifted you Milrit Sider. You got the sixth overall pick. And it's like, well, would, Ken, would have Ken Holland made that pick? Probably not. Definitely Knowing not. Ken Holland, he probably would have taken some other player that – probably would not be on the team right now. And the way that Iserman is approaching this, you know, it's let the prospects marinate. It's the same model that Ken Holland did. And a lot of people have to look back at Steve Iserman too. When he joined Tampa Bay, he had some names already. He did. He had yeah. Hedman, Stamkos, and then he got some luck in some drafts. He really did. You can't sit there and say that he was – all knowing and knew that some of these players were going to be great. No one knows that. 
if anyone tells you otherwise, then they're blowing smoke out their butt. So, yeah, I think a lot of people outside of Red Wings fan- fandom need to do a little due diligence, do some legwork, actually look into what exactly is going on with our team if you guys are really that interested in talking about the Detroit Red Wings because the slander is is getting real and a lot of people are taking it a little too far. Um, but we as fans know the true Red Wings fans, and I'm sure that there are some Red Wings fans out there that have been questioning Steve Eisenman for quite some time now. But the true fans will know and understand exactly what his game plan is. And yes, is it taking longer than what he would have liked it to be? Yeah, it is. I mean, we we talked about this already. Ken Holland made it very clear that rebuilds can take 10 years, especially when you don't get the lottery lock. If there was no lottery, we would have had Alexei Lafreniere. Maybe. I I don't know how much that would have helped, to be honest. (laughs) I I think we would have taken Tim Stutzel. I really do. I yeah. think Eisenman was really high on him. So Ottawa Suns, you know what? You guys got really lucky. All thanks to the San Jose Sharks, whatever. I can't remember if that was your third or your fifth pick that you got from San Jose. But still, regardless, you guys got lucky in that regard. But I think we got lucky with Lucas Raymond. He's still such a really good player. I do think that he can put up 60 plus this season. We technically got lucky with Mo Red Sider. Um, Simon Edvinson, Marco Casper, Nate Danielson, ASP. Uh, etc. There's so many other great players that we have that are we have to give them the time to marinate. And while yes, a lot of these players on this roster are stop gaps, but they're serviceable stop gaps to allow us to be competitive while letting our prospects marinate and become better players down the road for us. That you can't just insert them into the lineup and just be like, go be good. Go be good for us. While mm-hmm. you're playing with, you know, let me pull up that listing. And while you're playing with Philip Zadina, just an albocator as your wingers, Marco Casper, go do that. No, that ain't going to work. Yeah. That's that is not going to help at all. Work. There's a reason why players like Cholowski didn't work. Zadina didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, Evgeny Svechnikov didn't work. is because our prospect pool was just so thin and it was just poorly organized that we ruined their development by doing that. Dylan Larkin mm-hmm. is the only exception. Bertuzzi, you can even make the argument for Mantha. Looking back at it, happy that we got rid of him when we did because he definitely does not look that good anymore. Um, yeah. Robbie, I mean, you Robbie, could you can make that argument for Athanasiu too. I was watching like some old highlights, and to be completely honest with you, Zach, I miss Athanasiu. I know he didn't play one second of defense, but I honestly miss that kid. But he was a yeah, watcher. There was, he got there was some out outliers. Team. Yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. yeah, and those were the types of players that we really wanted. And a lot of us thought that that was actually going to be the core that we have currently mm-hmm. right now. And and if you look back, could you have said that like we would be in the position today as we do with the prospects that we have and still have kept all these players? I don't know. But yeah, I, I, can certainly, I can definitely say this. I'd rather have Dylan Larkin, Alex Abrinkett, Andrew Kopp, JT Comfort, David Perron, Robbie Fabry, Lucas Raymond, Jonathan Bergren over Mantha, Zadina, Philpula, Gagne, Perlini, and Abdelkader. I can easily say that. This team yeah, is 100%. a hell of a lot better than it was in 2019. Is it the best roster put together? No, but it's still a ser- serviceable roster. Far none. And I do think that we're a competitive team. We're a deep team. You can call us a bunch of third liners on one roster all you want. But it'll be funny when we get close to making the playoffs. If we make the playoffs, then Mm -hmm. shame on you guys. And you guys better start putting respect on the name. So, Matt, I think that's – I think we can end it right there. We can probably continue going on for another four to five hours on this but uh we easily could i honestly and there's one last thing i want to say um sure. i feel like with everybody criticizing eiserman i i feel like a lot of it is attributed to jealousy too i really can't speak on how many like how, like what teams these guys root for um i do know that i was arguing with a Habs fan which was really funny like you're probably just jealous that our gm didn't draft uh slavkovsky and reinbacher and pass on Logan Cooley and uh, Mitchkov, but I don't know. I, I really feel like a lot of it is jealousy. Um, what the plan is right now, people keep asking what the Iser plan is. I don't really know, but the best I can 
attribute it as we're going to be competitive in the short term, but we're set up for like a long term, like maybe a decade long of like cup contending, not just playoff contending, but cup contending relevancy. That's really what it seems like to me. I mean, why else would you sign these big free agents? Another thing is like, what's the number one thing when you sign a free agent and you go and watch their media availability? What's the first thing that they say? Hey, why did you decide to sign in Detroit? Oh, I like what Steve Eisenman is building. You really think that Detroit was the only team that was offering Comfort a $25 million contract, Cop a $30 million contract? No, they had other offers out there. I'm sure they did. But guess what? They chose Detroit because they like what they're building. Yeah. So there you go. That's what competent GMs get you. You get the free agents. Are they the biggest names? No, but you never get big names in free agency unless it's like Tavares who turned on the New York Islanders franchise. So I won't get into that, but um, yeah, that's just how, that's just how you got to build it in the short term, man. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. He's trying to turn this franchise around in the shortest time possible, but extending Mm -hmm. another 25 year playoff streak for us for the long term. That's for sure. That's 100% what he's trying to do here. So, but I think that's about it, buddy. I think we can kind of end it there. So let's go ahead and go into final thoughts. Um, my final thoughts are, let's go Red Wings. Y'all outside Red Wings fandom really need to uh, take a chill pill a little bit there. Just kind of calm down. Just kind of focus on your own team a little bit. Uh, I think it's a little weird that you guys are so infatuated with the Red Wings. Um, just keep it to yourself a little bit if you can. I get it that it's it's X. Twitter, whatever you want to call it, but y'all want to be trolls out there, but don't don't be spinning game on us, especially when your team didn't even make the playoffs either. Um, I just think that's really silly to do, and you're trying to create a rivalry when one's not even there, when both teams are irrelevant in terms of playoffs. So just stop it, please. It's You're embarrassing yourself. But uh, I digress, and uh, yeah, go Red Wings, and... Um, Looking forward to the season and uh, the prospect tournament with my buds. So uh, go Red Wings once again. All right, Matt, final thoughts, bud. Uh, this The off season is just way too long. Um, I think that's why everyone is arguing right now. We would not be arguing <laughs> if there were eight NHL games on tonight. Like we'd all be busy watching that and yeah. just talking up our players. Um, but the good news is I have my countdown on my phone, 53 days until the Red Wings play. So just tick, tick, tick. Keep ticking away. We'll get there eventually. Um, we'll, we'll see some prospects play. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Um, I'm definitely excited to watch our prospects play, of course, as a Red Wings fan. But I can't lie. I'm going to get real silly for Fantilli. I don't know if we're going to be able to see him play. I don't really know what the game's like schedule is, but I'm excited to see him. We'll figure it out, bud. But yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, let's go ahead and close it out. Thanks once again for y'all returning and joining us on this episode of Hockey Town University. If y'all are new, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and make sure you're smashing that like button. Turns the frown upside down. We like it here. Smiles only. All right. Other than that, yeah, you can catch us on YouTube or if you like to listen only, you can catch us on Spotify. And we look forward to speaking with y'all next weekend. And hopefully the regular season comes sooner than later for another 56 days, it seems like. All right. Well, Mm -hmm. that's about it, y'all. And until next time, we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. Adios, muchachos and muchachas.